Hello. I'm Mr. Money. People can't seem to get along without me as cash or credit. Well, here we are again. Yeah. Oh, hi, Mr. Money. Hello, John. And how are you today, Judy? Just great. You remember our learning machine over there? Oh, well, sure, that's a great gadget. What's it going to teach us today, Mr. Money? I'll turn it on and you'll see. One of the areas where we're seeing the feedback effects of different crises is the economic recession. It's very, very clear that the underlying issue of energy and our ability to sustain economic growth has been dependent on the cheap, widely available abundance of fossil fuels. This goes against the grain of neoliberal economic theory, which analyzes everything in isolation and doesn't acknowledge that the economy is embedded in the environment, that the economy is embedded in energy sources. Currently, we have a fractional reserve banking system. This system is based on the idea that you have a certain amount of assets in reserve in your bank and that you have the ability to lend out certain multiples of that asset in the form of money. So for example, you have one pound in reserve. You can lend out multiples of eight to ten times the amount that you actually have. What they said in the 1990s is this is not enough. We want new ways of making money. We want to be able to lend unlimited amounts. How can we do that? They said, let's have risk assessment models created by banks. And they would assess the levels of risk using these complex computer models. And if you could prove with these quantitative models that your levels of risk were very, very small, they could then justify lending at multiples of a thousand times the amount that you've got in your reserves. And this is what made the whole process of financialization very, very interesting for capitalists because you didn't have to produce anything. You didn't have to produce goods and services anymore. All you had to do was lend money to someone else who might be making goods and services or selling a product. And the more you lent them, the more they had to pay you back on compound interest. Obviously, you can see that this system was pretty much unsustainable because the global economy is a closed circle. I mean, how are you going to pay back money that isn't in the system? For you to pay it back, you need to borrow more. And for you to pay it back, you need to produce more and you need to exploit the environment more and you need to grow more. So it accelerated the pressure for unlimited growth. Millions of people use credit to buy the things that add up to a better living. Well, there's sure a lot of things that I'd like to buy for better living. How about giving me a little credit? Nobody gives you credit, John. It's something you have to earn. I don't understand, Mr. Money. How can you earn credit? Well, we'll select another channel on the learning machine by remote control and see. In the late 90s, banks were going crazy lending to people. And one of the areas where they were making the biggest profits was in the housing markets and on mortgages, where they were lending to people who they knew couldn't pay it back. You have a good reputation. We know you're reliable. I'm glad you think so. Uh, here's the note, and this is where you sign. They were then repackaging these mortgages as financial products that were safe to invest in and then were selling them on. They were then saying in the case that there was a default and that the guy didn't actually pay back the mortgage, we will insure you so you don't have to worry, it's very, very safe. The guys who were insuring, they didn't have any capital either, they didn't have any money to insure and they were taking money in. And it was just this massive bubble. It became something like 1.2 quadrillion dollars in size. That's 1,000 trillion dollars of virtual money. Compare that to 60 trillion dollars, which was the value of the real world economy. So what you're seeing is there's a massive disparity between real life, buying and selling, 
and this virtual financialization debt bubble. What happened in 2005 to 2008 is that that bubble reached the limits of the energy system, the reality check, that you can't grow infinitely. There is a real world, which is the boundary limit of what you can do. And at that point in 2008, when oil supply was dipping and demand was growing, that bubble is almost as if it was in a box. It couldn't grow anymore and it just burst. And at that point, the prices rocketed, inflation went through the roof, food prices went up, cost of living went up. Obviously, oil prices were going up and that was driving the prices of everything else going up. Because of all of these factors, people found it incredibly difficult to repay their mortgages. Because mortgages underpinned so much of the growth that was going on in the economy, it was a tipping point that ended up collapsing the whole house of cards. This is the BBC Home Service. Here is the 8 o'clock news. Sir John Ingram, speaking of the economic crisis at Worcester last night, warned the people of Britain to face further cuts in the near future. He stressed the importance of a rigid economy and appealed to everyone to accept the present austerity with fortitude and optimism. A foreign correspondent commenting on the speech said... But if you look at how governments are responding, they're not looking at the system and trying to change it. Instead, they're strengthening and centralizing it more. So who were the first people to suffer as a consequence of the recession? It was your average consumer. It was your average person on the street. The taxpayers whose money went into a massive bank bailout, which was used to cover up the insolvency of the banks. What that did in practice is that it centralized the power of the banks. It gave them a pat on the head that after you guys have royally cocked up, we're going to pay you some more money from the taxpayers who suffered. And meanwhile, by taking that money out of the economy, they actually made things worse. So you contracted the real economy, the productive economy, where things were needing to happen. And you created more business failures, more small business failures, more real economy contraction. At the same time, while these businesses failed, the larger companies, especially the big banks, who were now empowered by the massive bailouts that had come in, they started buying up a lot of these other businesses. So you had a situation where more centralization of ownership was also taking place. It's Saturday night, and everyone else is out having fun. It's the best excuse in the world to join the party. The reason why governments are responding in a way which is not dealing with the real issues is because they're adhering to this neoliberal ideology of the so-called free market system which promotes this idea that states should have a really limited role in the economy and that we should just completely open markets and give free reign to private investors to pretty much do what they like. The reason there's a fundamental conflict between the free market ideology as it stands or as it's promoted and real world democracy as we would like it to be it's just because we elect our representatives in order for them to actually organize societies, organize economies, you know, make policy decisions that are for everybody's benefit. But what the free market ideology does is it organizes the economy in such a way that the state should actually have no real role. So in other words, the free market ideology is actually taking power for these economic decisions and transactions completely out of the hands of the public and giving free reign to all manner of actors and vested interests that have nothing to do with the popular will. Now this ideology on a global scale is being pushed through by these global governance institutions, mainly the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, as well as the World Trade Organization. And what they're doing in countries in the South are often suffering from huge levels of deprivation. They have many political and social problems and they do need credit. 
is they're saying to these countries that if you're going to receive our loans, then you're going to have to abide by our rules for development. And what this actually does is it forces these countries to restructure their societies on the basis of these structural adjustment packages, to open their markets, to completely deregulate their societies, and to allow these private investors, largely based in the West, to come in and pretty much do what they like, to buy up resources, to invest, to take out capital whenever they feel like it. Essentially, it opens up these societies to the predatory exploits of transnational capital based in the West. Hello, George. Jim Chandler. Oh, I'm fine, thank you. Say, George, I have a gentleman I'd like to bring over to talk about locating a factory here. I thought you would. Eleven? Fine, we'll be there. You don't waste much time. Well, <laughs> but that's what we heard about you. What this means is that neoliberal globalization, a so-called free market ideology, is a broken system. It hasn't worked. On the pretext of creating growth and creating wealth, which they say is going to somehow trickle down to everybody, what they've actually done is centralize profits for a minority, is extract the resources, raw materials and labor within these countries for the benefit of a few, while accelerating huge levels of deprivation and debt in most of the world. And this process has empowered northern industrial centers to continue on this path of overconsumption and unlimited growth, which in turn has accelerated global crises.